Just what could the Smithsonian be hiding? Established in 1846, it's a tightly knit network of museums and research centers exclusively and uniquely funded by the United States government. Nicknamed the Nation's Attic, and for good reason. Made up of 19 museums, 9 research centers, and even a zoo, it's the official resting place for over 154 million historically valuable items. With an annual budget of around 1.2 billion public dollars, two-thirds of which coming from annual federal appropriations, it's safe to say that if the Institute needed to hide something, it would undoubtedly have the financial clout to do so. Through the years, the meddling in which the Institute has been reportedly involved in can be seen as not only overwhelming, but condemning of a hidden agenda. During our extensive research into alternative and controversial historical discoveries, we've often been confronted with such statements as, the Smithsonian people will be highly pleased to get their hands on this. Though, unfortunately, these sorts of condemning phrases have all but disappeared from mainstream media as the years have passed, they still do indeed exist within newspaper archives, stored within the libraries of Earth, and thankfully, there are many of them. As time has passed, reports of this involvement have become more and more elusive. This could be seen as a direct correlation with advancements within modern communications, the birth of the Internet, along with many other forms of learning, subsequently aiding in the distribution of said information, growing awareness of these reports exponentially. As a result, more in-depth and heightened understandings of evolution theory and the protection thereof becomes more developed and entwined with such institutions. Profiteers from these lies become guardians of secrets which could destroy their status, clearly lending to the possibility and motive for a cover-up. Although reports which hit the internet in 2014 claimed a Freedom of Information Act had revealed that the Smithsonian had covered up the remains of thousands of giants was eventually debunked. The flurry of attention it has created surrounding the topic, an allegation which we personally know to be accurate, has aided tremendously in the search for the truth surrounding these accusations. A source we highly recommend is a book by Richard J. Dewhurst, titled The Ancient Giants Who Ruled America, The Missing Skeletons, and The Great Smithsonian Cover-Up. It can not only be seen as a go-to resource for evidence of a race of ancient giants, but it also details the thousands of giant skeletons that have been found, particularly within the Mississippi Valley, as well as within the ruins of the giant cities over the past few centuries. It catalogues 400 years of excavations, newspaper articles, first-person accounts, state historical records, and illustrated field report, including more than 100 rare corroborative photographs. It reveals that not only was North America once ruled by an advanced race of giants, but also that the Smithsonian has been actively suppressing this physical evidence for nearly 150 years. Dewhurst shows how this suppression began shortly after the Civil War and transformed into an outright cover-up, this being due to Major John Wesley Powell, who was appointed Smithsonian Director, a strict pro-evolutionist. And finally, the 1920s discovery on Catalina Island, a megalithic burial complex with 6,000 years of continuous burials involving over 4,000 giant skeletons, including a succession of kings and queens, some more than nine feet tall, the evidence for which he claims, and with good reason, is hidden in the restricted access evidence rooms at the Smithsonian. The Crystal Skulls, a set of the world's most alluring artifacts, possessing the power to create religions, snaring many a Hollywood figure with their mysticism and rumored possible alien origins. Firstly, how does one tell a real crystal skull from a fake? There are always artists capable of making and selling things that seem old, says anthropologist Jane McLaren Walsh of the Smithsonian Museum. And she should know, Walsh has seen her share of fakes. In fact, she's probably seen more crystal skulls than anyone else alive, subsequently becoming the leading academic on the subject. A stern skeptic with a ruthless ethic, only the most puzzling will convince Jane. Another major player in the skull game, according to Walsh, was Frederick Arthur Mitchell Hedges, an English stockbroker turned adventurer, who in 1943 began displaying a skull at dinner parties which he called the Skull of Doom. 
His daughter Anna later claimed that he had found the skull in a ruined temple in Belize during the early 1920s. However, this was later found to have been a lie. Investigations by the Linnean Society of London, a research institute specializing in taxonomy and natural history, revealed that Mitchell Hedges actually purchased his skull at auction at Sotheby's in London in 1943. How it came to be at the auction house, however, was never established. Which is unfortunate, because the Mitchell Hedges skull, according to Walsh's scrupulous examination, is the only one she has ever had to reluctantly confirm as an authentic crystal skull. What's more, it is the only academically accepted original known within the public archives. Smaller than other examples, which under microscope analysis were seen to have been made using rotary drills, the Mitchell Hedges skull is a more finely crafted, yet more crudely designed example that under the atomic microscope has shown signs of having indeed been an ancient pre-Columbian artifact, which sure enough was constructed using, quote, unknown technology. There are of course many examples of crystal skulls around the world, and many more stories surrounding their mysterious construction. Elongated examples, stories of groups of these skulls initiating some form of energy field. Ancient laser cutting technology has also been claimed time and time again. However, we felt we would approach them from another angle, to experience the rare occasion when modern, specifically funded academic institutes buckle to overwhelming evidence proofs given by the defeated skeptic to those who pursue nothing but the perplexing truth and a direction for study. Made from a single piece of quartz crystal, Mitchell's Skull of Doom is unquestionably an exquisite example of an unknown history here upon our planet. Regardless of beliefs or indeed the superstitions which now surround them, there are a rare few which support the theory of lost civilization and ancient visitation. This skull is much smaller than many and crudely carved, leading museum scholars here to believe that in a world of fakes, this one is the real thing. We have in the past covered a vast array of evidence which suggests the past existence of giants. Yet, alas, much of what is or has now either unfortunately been suppressed, destroyed, stolen, or forgotten about with the remains of their initial discoveries now often only to be found remaining, proverbially, cast in stone in the form of the library archives of the world and the news reports now digitally preserved within. Often follow-up reports abruptly ceased after the mention of the rapid arrival and insatiable interest of the Smithsonian, among others in said finds. However, now, thanks to the popularity of such subjects, the power and speed of modern technology, such finds made during excavations involving a large array of individuals, make modern cover-ups difficult and are rarely accomplished. With the only modern, almost openly admitted one of note, having followed the discovery of the supposed tomb of Osiris, when all media was immediately banned from the site. When permitted back, the tomb had already been penetrated and was subsequently claimed as having been found empty, supposedly previously looted. This regardless of its near impenetrability, with Gantenbrink only making it successful with modern robotics. But I digress. Working in cooperation, a team involving the Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, a team from the Penn Museum, University of Pennsylvania, among others, discovered a sarcophagus academically claimed as having belonged to a, quote, King Sobekteheb, probably Sobekteheb the first dated 1780 BC during the 13th dynasty. What we find astonishing regarding the find, however, is its sheer size. Carved from a single quarried piece of Aswan granite, initially weighing hundreds of tons, this finished tomb still weighs a minimum of 60 tons it was somehow transported to the burial site and placed seemingly with delicacy where it now lay. Its resting place, inner chamber, also some three meters in length. The baffling enigmas of why such size? How were they moved? To explain how these feats were accomplished is far less difficult challenge 
if one incorporates into their postulations the possibility that the size of these tombs were, in fact, made to measure, indeed a match, to the height and scale of the civilization who buried them. Could the inclusion of ancient giants into the many other theories surrounding the mysteries of Giza solve the puzzle we still can't solve of how these stones were moved? It is a hypothesis which we find very fitting. Again, in regards to this fascinating subject, we must remark upon the outstanding work of William R. Corliss and his collecting of remarkable tales of ancient giants, but what's more, his general conclusive consensus, and in which, due to our own research, we also share. For example, he mentions on page 102 of his source book, Strange Artifacts, that, quote, the ancient people of most countries seem to have possessed in the strongest degree a faith of giantology, end quote, a feeling we also share having validated our suspicions. He goes on to mention a tale of the astonishing size of the statues, said to have represented the beings who once dwelled within the true ancient Egypt. Quote, In front of the portals of the palace of Karnak are gigantic human statues, and in one of the courts are twelve immense stone figures, each fifty-two feet high. The adjacent palace of Luxor has two granite statues thirty-eight feet high at the entrance. In the ruins near Thebes are three huge figures, now thrown down, one being sixty-four feet high, and in the palace of Parthenon of Athens, many years before Christ, was a statue of Minerva, 36 feet high. The Temple of Olympia contained a seated statue of a god who rose almost to the ceiling, which would have made it some 68 feet high." End quote. He mentions that entering these places gives one the impression that they are entering the past dwelling place of giants. Yet, what he goes on to say was found is astounding. Gaius Plinius Secundus called Pliny the Elder, was a Roman author, naturalist, and natural philosopher, and naval and army commander of the early Roman Empire, and a friend of the Emperor Vespasian. He wrote the Encyclopedic Naturalis Historia, which became an editorial model for encyclopedias. He states that, after an earthquake in a Crete mountain, witnessed the complete intact remains of an ancient giant some 46 cubits long or 60 to 70 feet tall. Beings of this scale would easily explain how such enormous stones were moved, yet how they could have been hidden from history is an unknown motive, which we find highly compelling. <laughs>